Hallelujah. Church, we have come to the time of listening to God's word. As I mentioned earlier, a brand new month with a brand new focus. Achievement. Wow. <laughs> you know, last month, you know, we had gone through the focus on possession. At the very beginning of the month, I was wondering, God, what are we going to talk about possession? Little did I realize that God had so much. I was so richly blessed through all the platforms, Abide, Lifeline, guest speakers, so much of insight about possession. I truly believe that even this month, achievement, God is going to use this focus to further enlarge our understanding. And it will be a blessing to all of us as well. Amen, church. So I hope that our theme for 2021, my life for His glory, is continuing to get deeply embedded in your hearts as we at once into another focus to fulfill God's purposes in our church. Church, do you know that elects who belong to God and NCKL, that we are created in Christ for God's glory? This is our purpose, church, our calling and our reason for existence. As written in Isaiah 43, verse 6 to 7, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Hallelujah. All of us were made for his glory. Today we are in Christ Jesus. God has a plan for each one of us. Furthermore, all that we do, church, even the most routine acts of everyday life can serve this God-given purpose. Because the Bible says, as I have used this to support our theme for this year, taken from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31b, do all to the glory of God. So all that we do must glorify God. That's the purpose. That's the intent of God for all our lives at NCCL. As such, our whole life in Christ is built with this one purpose, to bring about God's plan of redemption, to fill the whole earth with this glory through our lives. This way, we will find true fulfillment and satisfaction, where we will find true achievements in Christ. Let me say this to you, church, that all other achievements in life will fade away, church. But this will last forever. My life for His glory. This morning, I've entitled my message as, What are you living for? Before I get started, let me reaffirm once again that the greatest achievement of Christ through His righteous act, namely His baptism, death, and resurrection, that saved our souls, without which there will be no other. In a day when the message of the gospel truth is co-opted with so many man-made doctrines and twisted beyond description by false teachers and preachers, it is my heart's desire and a burden. I want to make this point that elects at NCKL must first and foremost fully understand, believe, and embrace the gospel of God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. You must understand the willingness of Jesus Christ to come to this world as a man, born of a virgin. The word became flesh and blood. And to be baptized by John the Baptist to take our sins and the sins of the world upon his own body and subsequently to die on the cross and experience death for all men and the resurrection on the third day to justify our faith in the gospel of God's righteousness. This is the greatest achievement of all time, church. And Christ fulfilled it for all of us. 
So as we look into achievement throughout this month, never ever forget, this is the greatest achievement ever done by a man who is God himself. This achievement is so foundational, central and essential to the work of Christ that all of his other achievement thereafter will collapse without this one. To be sure, we must magnify the achievements of Jesus through the gospel of God's righteousness, without which the sins of humanity cannot be eradicated, thus nullifying everything else that people look to Jesus to receive. I hope that our anointed preachers and teachers throughout this month, through all the platforms, that they will firmly endeavor to establish this gospel word in the hearts of the people, the hearers, as we venture into this new focus, achievement. Let me ask you again, what are you living for? Human beings can achieve many things. Though any achievement which disregards God is futile. Let it be known, church, that human achievements like amassing wealth, political power, buildings, great learning, military victories, acts of courage, and spiritual achievement are futile because they are limited and lead one to pride and often gives false security of true achievement. I believe most of us at NCCKL want our lives to count for something. We sense something deep inside us that wants to make some kind of difference in this world, to leave a mark, a lasting legacy. And ever since we have met the gospel of God's righteousness, this longing has always been there. Church, make no mistake. It is the Holy Spirit who has put such a longing for significance to do something worthwhile in Christ before we meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. However, I notice this pregnant desire miscarries because of lack of knowledge pertaining to the will of God with regard to achievements in Christ. Often elects are unable to appropriate their lives and their inner drive to serve God, to achieve great exploits for Jesus because they are confused between godly achievements and personal achievements. Let me give you some biblical perspectives on three important areas so that we may know what are you living for. Point number one, true living. The Bible gives us extensive perspective with regard to true living in Christ. I find Solomon's personal experiences gives us an insight into what it means to possess a true living in Christ. Solomon, one person in the Bible who had everything, wisdom, power, riches, honor, reputation, and God's favor, and yet he is the one who discussed the ultimate emptiness of all that this world can offer him. He tried to destroy people's confidence in their own efforts, abilities, and righteousness and direct them to commitment to God as the reason for true living. I'd like to read a portion of scripture for you, taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 to 11. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit as a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place from which the rivers come. There they return again. All things are full of labor. 
Men cannot express it. The eyes is not satisfied with seeing. No, the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. What a wisdom, what an experience. A man who knows what he's talking about, the great preacher, Solomon. In this passage, Solomon had a purpose for writing skeptically and pessimistically. Near the end of his life, he looked back for everything he had done and most of it seemed meaningless. There's a common belief that only the good people prospered and that only the wicked people suffered. But that hadn't been proven through in Solomon's experience. Solomon wrote this book after he had tried everything and achieved much only to find that nothing apart from God made him happy. Church, true living church, he wanted the readers to avoid the same senseless pursuits. If we try to find meaning in our achievement rather than in God, we will never be satisfied and everything we pursue will become wearisome. Solomon's kingdom was in its golden age. But Solomon wanted the people to understand that success and prosperity don't last long. We find this in Psalm 103, verses 14 to 16. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. And the New Testament, James says in this manner, in James 4, verse 14, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? Is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Church, all human achievements will one day disappear and we must keep this in mind in order to live wisely. If we don't, we will become either proud or self-sufficient when we succeeded or surely disappointed when we fail. Solomon's goal was to show that earthly possessions and achievements are ultimately meaningless. Only the pursuit of God brings real satisfaction. We should honor God in all we say, think and do. Many people were not born again of the water and spirit. Even Christians who claim to be born again. They feel restless and dissatisfied even after claiming to have attained great achievements spiritually or even in the world. They wonder why they are so tired and unfulfilled. And they ask this question all the time. What is true meaning of life? Wondering whether when they look back on it all, will they be happy with their achievements? They're not sure. At times wondering even, you know, why they feel burnt out, disillusioned and dry. And they're always hoping that what they do will be worthwhile and bring some sense of hope to their life. In this passage, Solomon wants us to test our faith, whether it is rested on God's righteousness or not. And he's challenging us to find true and lasting meaning in God alone. This man, he knows what he's talking about, church, about true living. As we take a hard look at our life, as Solomon did is, we will see how important serving God is over all other options. Throughout this month, we're going to see and hear a lot about achievements. Maybe, perhaps, God is asking us to rethink our purpose and direction in life 
Just as Solomon did in Ecclesiastes. Through living. What are we living for? It's very important that we ask this question. In this church, we have that privilege to do the soul searching. That we can align ourselves in the perfect will of God. I find this in Ezra chapter 3 verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. Church, be reminded that our belief, attitude and conduct is more important than personal achievement. This temple was built again because the Babylonians destroyed the temple that Solomon built. Fifty years after its destruction, the temple was rebuilt again. Somewhere around 536 BC, before Christ. Now, Some of the older people remembered Solomon's temple and they wept because the new temple would not be as glorious as the first one. But the beauty of the building was not nearly as important to God as to the belief, attitude and conduct of the builders and the worshippers. God cares more about who we are than what we can achieve. Our world is changing, and once magnificent achievement decay and disappear. The church, sometimes we wonder, the early church, how glorious and mighty and powerful it was. Signs and wonders, people were so committed and dedicated to the Lord and Right now, 2,000 years later, when we see the spiritual church, you know, is fighting and struggling and lost and so few people are truly believing the gospel through then we wonder. So like these people who saw the early temple built by Solomon, so glorious, laid with gold. Right now, they did with the same acacia wood, but there's no gold there. And they begin to weep. But there were some people who were shouting with joy. No matter what, they continue to thank God because God is looking at the people who are worshipping, people who took time to build it again with their attitude, with their conduct, with their belief. It's exactly what's happening right now. 2,000 years later at NCCKL, we continue to build the work of God. We will shout for joy. Yes, we may not have the, the glorious moments of the early church, but right now, the world, the religious Christianity is being in the doldrums for quite a while. People have literally push it out of their mainstream life. But we know that God has eaten His church. This church is continuing. It may not be a big numbers, but yet God is doing mighty works and we are part of His church. So we won't web. We will shout with glory and honor that God will do mighty things, that His glory will fill up the whole universe in the days to come. The church, we will continue to work that's true living church. We always will seek to serve God wholeheartedly. So that we don't have to compare our work with anyone else in the past, present and future. What God has entrusted to us, the gospel of God's righteousness, we will do. We will share, we will preach, we will expand God's kingdom on earth. And God's glory will be manifested in His time. Even right now we can see God doing mighty things in our church. In 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, talking about true living. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, its own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Church, do not lose your self-worth for personal achievements. People often lose their self-concept on their achievement. But our relationship with Christ is far more important than our jobs, successes, wealth and knowledge. We have been chosen by God as His very own and we have been called to represent Him to others. Remember that our value comes from being one with Christ, united in spiritual union and communion. Not from what we can achieve, church. True living is about what God can do in and through us for the glory of God. Our worth comes in that manner. We have worth because of what God is doing, not what we do. The church, true living, it's all about God. 
and God doing mighty things through our life. So throughout this month, you're going to hear a lot about achievement. So always bear in mind, what are you living for? Don't be deceived by the evil one. But rather, we will be wise in our living. And we will learn from the scriptures the perspective of God and understand that God has given us all these examples and his scriptures so that we will always will recognize and examine our hearts and have that true living to glorify God. Point number two, church, true greatness. Now let's now look into God's perspective with regard to true greatness. Have you noticed that in the Bible, church, for most part, God ignores the great people, the so-called great people. He's not very impressed with the empire builders then, great political leaders of the day, military geniuses, philosophers, writers, artists, architects, entertainers, and other historical eye achievers. From the very beginning of time, many people leave church. Right now, we have got about almost like 8 billion people who are alive today on the face of this earth. But many of these people who do a lot of studies on human population, they're saying that almost like 40 billion people have lived and died prior to this. So many people in the past, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, we don't find much about them in the Bible, except for some. If when God does mention them, frequently it is to expose their ridiculousness of their inflated sense or ego of personal greatness, such as Pharaoh in Exodus and King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel. You know, they were the poster boys of false greatness. They at least got a biblical mention, though perhaps they would have preferred obscurity. Nothing to brag about. God doesn't even want to mention or ink on most of the rest. So many people have lived. You notice that God always is more concerned about the people of faith, the genealogy of people who walked by faith, believing in His word. We find this in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars, He said to those who reject Him. When God's eyes ran to and fro throughout the earth to give strength and power to those who were committed to Him, they were the ones who were great in the eyes of God. The worldly greats did not capture God's attention at all, church. They were ignored. No matter what they achieved in this side of the world, it did not matter to God at all. The people who received strength because they wholeheartedly were committed and loyal to Him, they became the apple of the eyes in the sight of God. Today we know what really captures God's attention. People like Abraham, the worldly standard, what did Abraham really achieve during his lifetime? What did he have to show for his life when he died? Not much, church. He had a few children. He had one tiny piece of property for his burial. You can read it in the scriptures in the book of Genesis. And some wealth in livestock. And yet, Abraham, by God's standard, was one of the greatest men ever lived. And what made Abraham great church? One thing, Abraham believed God. Genesis 15, 6. You find this in the New Testament. Paul echoes it again in Galatians 3, 6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Talking about greatness, church, true greatness. He believed God with his whole heart, whole being. He banked his life on the belief that God existed and rewarded those who earnestly seek him. You find this in Hebrew 11, verse 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Abraham was one church. He diligently seeked God. He believed in God's promise to that much that he did not even have to receive what was promised in his lifetime. But yet, he believed. You find this in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 13. These are all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Abraham believed God. He's our father of faith. We have the same germinating faith within our hearts. Some of the promises that we made to us. Maybe in this lifetime, we will not be able to experience it. But God is ever true to His promises. People like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, many more in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, they believed God. No matter what came me, they were great in the sight of God. They drew God's attention, church. God is looking from heaven. He's looking at people who have faith in their hearts. There are many people who are living in this world right now who gain that sort of attention from God. People of faith, church. And we have it in our church. We have the true faith in our heart, the gospel of God's righteousness. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, church. And his belief, church, particularly Abraham's belief in God, led him to obey God's call on him to leave his family. When he was living in the Earl of Chaldeans, God called him out. He left everything, his culture, his environment, his relatives, his friends, his occupation. He just obeyed God to go into a foreign land. He settled in Iran for a moment before God took him to the promised land. He went in as an alien, as an exile, all for the sake of God's glory and his future promises and purposes. God had a plan that through this one man, a family will be established. To that family, a nation will be established. And to this nation, the whole world will be saved. The same faith. God said that through Abraham's seed, the families of this world will be blessed. You find this in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 8 and 9 church. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Abraham's faith filled obedience to seek God's kingdom first, changed the course of human history, church, and he's still changing it right now. We have the same faith of Abraham within our heart, faith in God's righteousness. Now what we do, what we don't do, what God did. We always talk about the baptism, the death and the resurrection. Three righteous acts of Jesus that saved our soul. The same faith in our heart, no matter what, we will hold on to this glorious truth. No church, hardly any Abraham's earthly contemporaries is remembered. In fact, none church except those who shared his faith in God. And we find that even right now, God is still using those who have that faith in their hearts to change the landscape of this world, particularly in the spiritual realm. God is moving mightily through his children. We have the power to administer grace and to save souls by preaching the gospel of God's righteousness. And that's the greatest in the sight of God, church. There are many people out there doing many great feats. They all will fade away. They all will come to nothing. But what we do, when we serve God and serve the gospel, like Abraham, we will be noticed. God will do mighty things through our lives because to Him, to God, we are very special. We are chosen. We are a people who have received mercy, grace, love in our lives. We want to reciprocate God's love to our lifestyle. In point number three, church, through achievement. Let me now give you a biblical perspective of what this true achievement is. What great pursuit are you devoting your life to, church? If I ask you a question on this Sunday morning, what is it that you want to achieve? What do you really believe will make the biggest difference in the world? You know, how you answer these questions will dictate 
how you will invest your second life that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. That's found in the gospel of God's righteousness. Church, don't believe the promises of false greatness, church. Give up the pursuit of shallow greatness. We will never find true greatness in the sight of God by the achievements the world admires most. Don't be mistaken. Don't be misled or misdirected. The truly great people in God's eyes are not the great achievers, but the great believers in the gospel of God's righteousness. That's true achievement, church. Today we are, all of us, I keep mentioning this to you. You talk about achievement, this achievement, we are so blessed. We have achieved something that the world could not. A few of them find a way of life. Only a few. Most of them are going on the broader gate. We have found a narrow gate. We have the truth. And we got to pass it on to our children, to our offspring, to the people around us. Because we are the people who believe God and we seek His kingdom and His righteousness all the days of our life. This is the achievement that God is talking about, church. True achievement. Because we know, church, there's no greatness of our own. We recognize that. We admit nothing great about us. In our flesh, nothing good comes out of it. We admit, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. All the good that comes out of us is because of Christ in us. It's in Him that we can leave a legacy, a lasting legacy. All greatness is from God and God alone. So we are free to serve God and to serve all men. You find this in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. And He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Today we are able to serve God, serve humanity, serve the gospel because our Lord is a servant king. We are united with him in spiritual union. This is the greatest achievement. We can because we have the gospel of God's righteousness. We are united with Christ and we have the servanthood art. We want to serve God. We want to offer ourselves so the people might know Him. Church, that's achievement, church. Something that we cannot do it before. Right now we can. We want to avail ourselves. We want to preach. We want to teach. We want to guide. We want to lead. That's achievement, church, because the faith that is in us causes us to serve all men. Because we know in this world, there's no lasting city. It all will come to an end. So our eyes are always on the city with the everlasting foundations. You find this in Hebrew chapter 13, verse 14. For here, we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. It's all the same faith that is in our hearts as well. No matter what we have in this side of the world, yeah, we will be good steward. We will enjoy them for a moment of time, but we don't get attached to them. We know that our city, God is the one who is building it, not at the ends of man. In Hebrew 11, verse 10, another scripture, this is talking about Abraham as well. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. We too, church. That's our ultimate home. That's where we are going. Because there's such an attitude, like Abraham and his descendant of faith, they did not lay their treasures on this side of the world. Their treasures are always eternal. Because when they had that attitude, they are willing to forego all the things of this world in order to respond to God's call, nothing will stop them. They laid everything behind and they walked with Him faithfully because they know that this God who called them is faithful, that He is able to provide all their needs and to fulfill all their aspirations and their desires. You find this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So our treasure is eternal. Nobody can touch it. Nobody can take it away from Him. He will not even decay and corrode. So our treasure is everlasting. So the great believers are willing to go into lands for the sake of God's purposes, to bless all the families of this earth. That's why Jesus gave us a great commission to take the gospel to the world to go out there and to baptize and to teach all of them to observe all things that He has taught us. And lo, He'll be with us. And we keep doing it. And our church, 
The time has come for us to rise up. True achievement is this. What we have found, we share it to the people in the world. We fulfill the mandate given to us, the great commission in preaching, teaching, guiding and leading. That's great achievement, church. This is our call, church. So we are willing to give up our pursuits that are so shallow. It's all like delusions. And people talk about this kind of a greatness. To us, these physical achievements are not great. Yeah, they have certain value to it. But end of the day, what's more greater is God's achievement. Working along with Him, serving with Him. That's true, great living church. Like having a radical faith in God's righteousness. You know, constantly walking in the Spirit, serving God, giving all that we have, our lives, a living sacrifice, following Him wherever He leads us. It's a call upon our life, church. This is what God expects from us as well. We talk about great or true achievement. At the end of our life, this is what we want to be so satisfied with because we have truly served Him. Because we believed in what He has done for us and what He wants to do through us. I believe that when we all of us at NCKL, when we can get this right, the biblical perspective of true achievement, together as a body of Christ, a family of God, we can do great exploits in bringing the gospel to the hearts of men, church. Let me say this to you, church. All the events and achievements that capture today's headlines. Every day when you open up the newspapers or you go to the social media, so much of things happening every other day. There come a time that when all these things will just look like historical footnotes in comparison to the achievement in Christ. It's permanent. It's ultimate. It's lasting. In the end, the great believers of the gospel of God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection are truly great achievers because we build a house that God is building and therefore the greatest house and the only home that will last forever and ever. We find this in Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So what they have to show of their lives when they die, may not look like much, church. Don't be so caught up with that world. Sometimes we can be so deceived and deluded, thinking that that's where everything is. No, church. True achievement is in Christ. What we build, church, will go on growing forever and ever, church. So those of you who are serving in the various ministries, please don't grow tired. Keep doing the right thing. Those who are Sacrificing our time, you know, the abide ministry, the lifeline. All of us are given the opportunity. The Tamil church, the English church, the various ministries. You know, all this that we are doing, we are building God's house, God's building. And this will continue to grow. One day maybe we will leave this world. But it will continue to grow. It will have an eternal mark. It will have a long-lasting legacy. So we are so privileged to be given such a task in these last days. So church, don't let your desire for true living, true greatness, and true achievement miscarry. Make your life count for the one thing that really matters to the heart of God. My life for His glory. So church, this year our theme, my life for His glory. And through all these focuses, I pray that we will get it right. That we will walk in it and cause God to do mighty things to our lives. That we can leave something behind for our children.